So tuning into an intention towards a peaceful relationship with our experience. What would that feel like to not have a problem with however the however our experience is right now? So maybe we can intuit, have a sense of what peace feels like, even if it's not a complete understanding even if there's still agitation to some degree in the body or mind. but it's really an attitude of peacefulness that we're exploring with however the conditions are. So maybe not limited by the particular conditions whether they're pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Can the heart have a peaceful relationship with whatever's being known here and now? And this flavor of peacefulness is also the flavor of goodwill. Kindness. Friendliness. Compassion, the desire to not cause harm to ourselves or to others.
So there's always a relationship between the mind and what's being known. We might be aware of sensations in the body, feeling of contact between the skin of the hands and wherever they're placed or our butt on the cushion, these contact points. Aware of a thought or of a sound or of the temperature in the room. Aware of an emotion. And we can notice any relationship, any attitude in the mind that's flavoring our awareness. Maybe we don't like some aspect of our experience, want it to go away. Or maybe we like some aspect of our experience, want to hold on to it. Maybe we feel dismissive of our experience that it's boring, there's not much happening. We can explore what a, a peaceful but intimate relationship would look like with whatever is being known. It's the same kind of interest that we would use to show up to a good friend, really present attentive, but not demanding, not expecting anything. So there's a receptivity and an intimacy or presence. But without any agenda, and this is where the peacefulness comes from. From the absence of an agenda, trying to figure anything out or control any part of our experience. So let's continue practicing in silence finding our own way to balance these factors of interest and presence and relaxation.
one question we could ask if we find the mind is distracted or not interested is, is it possible to be aware, be present in a peaceful way without causing harm to myself or to others? A simplicity of awareness, not having a problem with things being simple. Not having a problem with any object of awareness that comes and goes. Putting our attention more on the awareness than on any particular object. In a sense, settling back, relaxing, and being aware.
Noticing that it matters what we pay attention to. How we pay attention. Dwelling on disturbing thoughts leads to disturbance in the mind. The Buddha recommended mindfulness of the body. So we can tune into embodied experience in a way that is calming and grounding. Maybe feeling the rhythm of breathing in the whole body, the energy of breathing. If that feels soothing, breathing happening on its own, not controlling it. Or a sense of stability, sensing the contact with the ground. Or a sense of openness, sensing the space around us. So these are signs that the mind can tune into that can support letting go, a sense of safety and ease.
And for the last minute of our meditation, if your eyes have been closed, maybe having them open, letting go of directing the mind to any particular experience. Sitting right in the middle of our experience in a peaceful way. So I'll take a minute and feel free to stretch your legs if you'd like. So thanks for being here. Um, So yeah, this group meets twice a month and we've been going through this list uh, called the Parami, which is a list of 10 virtues. And we've been using a book uh, that Cam has uh, sort of as a guide moving through it. But Uh, Yeah, each session stands on its own. So glad you could join. Um, Yeah, so today the topic is Sila, which uh, is the second of the list of 10. So the first was generosity. And um, moving on from generosity now is Sila, which uh, there are different translations for in the book, or not in the book, but he has a, um, these 10 cards that, um, that I sent out a while back um, on our email list. And if anyone wants to get on the email list and, and isn't, there's a sign up here in person or online um, through the calendar. And I just send out um, some of the resources that I'm using as I'm preparing for these talks. Um, but I'll just read what, how Ajahn Suchito describes this because I really like his, his description. So he translates it here as morality. And then he says, recognizing the confidence that develops from personal integrity and respect for others, I aspire to cultivate actions of body, speech, and mind that turn away from hostility and harshness and that cut off greed and manipulative behavior. So I think there's a lot in there, um, which hopefully we'll unpack as we go along. Uh, I think one theme that stands out is uh, the confidence that comes about self-confidence. We can even say self-esteem. There's so many things that we can't control and that people judge us by, you know, just in terms of society and culture, but one thing we do have, not complete control over, but um, but some control for sure. And uh, this is really the domain of sila is kind of exercising this ability to discern where our actions are coming from and, and to be skillful and, and to choose. And we do this all day long. We're making decisions all day long. So this is nothing new. This is a very, you know, basic, concept. Um, 
Uh, and yet I think it, yeah, there's just, in my experience, been, yeah, there's just so much depth um, to this practice. Um, there's these five uh, abstentions, commonly called the five precepts, which um, are really, um, yeah, nothing will stand out. You know, a lot of spiritual traditions have recommendations on our behavior. Um, so I'll, these five are to refrain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxicating the mind, which leads to heedlessness or carelessness. So, you know, these are pretty, pretty standard for a lot of spiritual traditions and probably just a lot of, yeah, just traditions of people all over the world at different times and places. These yeah, don't stand out as anything that extraordinary. And yet, uh, the subtlety or the depth or kind of the nuances that we can bring to them, like not lying, you know, how often do we shade the truth, even if it's just a little to ease things or to get some slight advantage? And in, in all, with all five of them, um, we can um, learn a lot by... Um, by committing to them, by taking them on. And this isn't something that anyone make, forces us to do. It's something that we can choose if we see, if we think that it, it's a value to kind of have some more objective standards for our behavior um, and to see what we can learn by, you know, by holding those up to our to our behavior and, and checking it out. So that's one thing that stands out from that description is the confidence that develops when we can look at our actions and basically feel good that we're doing our best. This is called the bliss of blamelessness, which can sound kind of lofty, but uh, I think it's just the relative more or less absence of regret you know we i think we all know that feeling where we just put our foot in our mouth say something we we really don't mean hurt someone's feelings or whatever it might be you know drive too fast you know just all these things just how easy it is to cause harm when especially when we're not mindful when we're not careful when we're caught up in some drama or whatever it might be So, um, yeah, so this confidence that we can have that we're doing our best to live from our values. And then I like that he says, uh, just kind of pointing to this connection that our actions condition our mind. So it, there's sort of this mutually supportive or this feedback loop between our actions and our state of mind. So. Sayadaw Tejaniya, who's a, a well-respected um, Burmese monk, said something once like, try keeping the precepts. So like, try, try having good behavior if your mind is really agitated and all over the place and you know, full of anger or something. It's hard. Uh, so, that, so they support each other. So, but in like having these standards, um, you know, whatever they might be, but the five precepts, as you know, I, you know, I basically recommend them not because they're objectively some ethical standard, although I think you could, you can look at them that way, but because they really can illuminate our mind, you know, we're about to kill a mosquito and we remember we've taken on this precept and then we get to see what, you know, what is the mind that wants to kill a mosquito like? Um, so I like that he points out just the tendencies that we have to act out of hostility and harshness, greed and manipulative behavior, and how um, being aware of our actions that are motivated, um, what they're motivated by, it's sort of like it's hard to uh, have only loving thoughts, although we might like that and we might aspire to that, and the Buddha really recommends you know, metta, goodwill, as something we can cultivate all day long. 
So this is a really great cultivation. And actually, um, apparently the Buddha said that cultivating metta, loving kindness or goodwill, is even more beneficial than sila, which is what we're talking about today, of, of being careful with our behavior. And maybe one of the reasons he said that is because it's sort of getting at our karma, you know, our, um, our actions, getting at the root of our actions at a deeper level, you know, the level of intention. If our heart is only full of goodwill all day long, it's going to be, we're probably not going to cause a lot of harm. So sila in a way is sort of a, a higher level intervention, you know, and, but we want to have all levels of intervention because it all matters and it all is mind training because to catch ourselves when we're about to do something that you know is unskillful or you know that could cause uh, problems for ourselves and others to be able to catch that is a really great way to to train our minds um i think i mentioned this in a different session but just how much i learned I was the office manager here for six years, and it's such a great place to practice because everyone, when they're here, is doing their best to show up with their best selves. And so I learned so much just about, you know, how, uh, you know, I might get irritated sometimes. You know, there's a lot to do. It's busy. People would, you know, ask me to do all sorts of things, and there wasn't enough time to do it all. So, but at least on the outside, I wanted to convey a sense of peacefulness and, and kindness. And it really, it seemed like it really mattered. Like it, it does matter, yeah, how we show up and how we speak and, you know, these more gross levels of our behavior. Um, and it, it matters for training our minds too, um, you know, to act even when we feel irritable, to be kind, to speak without trying to cause harm. It's a training, and it, uh, and it points to that, you know, it helps us see what's active in our minds, because we see that we're about to, you know, be mean or something, or be, be rude, or be impatient. So I want to go through some of the reasons why we might be interested in this, uh, this sila. And there's different definitions, like I was saying. Um, one, as I was reading through the different definitions, one that I came up with is just being careful with our behavior. And I think that's pretty all-encompassing. So why would we want to be careful with our behavior? You know, because it can sound a little bit like being tight. And I think, you know, when people can be turned off by this topic because maybe we've all kind of we don't like being told what to do and and uh and we can sense that there's uh there can be a shadow to this sort of restraint with our behavior where it just becomes repression or becomes uh yeah um yeah in some way some sense that somebody out there god or you know, our parents or something are looking at our behavior and condemning us for something. And so we want to be aware of that tendency that we may have, and we internal we can internalize that and then always judging ourselves, never good enough. My sila's never good enough. But you know, the point of being careful with our behavior isn't to be perfect, isn't to meet some objective standard. That's not the ultimate goal. And the Buddha was explicit about this. He would talk about people who, maybe monastics, who did train and maybe were really careful with their behavior, but it just served to make them arrogant or to compare themselves with others. So the, the deeper aim is to see what we can learn about our mind by being careful with our behavior because it's for our own welfare and for the welfare of others. Um, so we'll get into that, some of the motivations, why we would be interested in this, why it would be something that we would actually be interested in or even, yeah, like devoted to or um, 
just like have have a lot of reverence for, have a lot of respect for, really like hold as a precious jewel, you know, the my commitment to being careful with my behavior, um, that that could be something beautiful, a source of self-confidence, like uh, I was saying. But one of the, the first reasons that we would be interested in this is out of compassion for others, because we recognize how easy it is to cause harm, even when we don't, even not coming from a place of cruelty, but just because it's easy to cause harm and, and we care. There's, um, yeah, so one way that this is talked about is that we give others the gift of non-fear when we're, um, when we abstain from taking life, from stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and use of intoxicants, we give others, I'll just read from this sutta, there are five gifts, five great gifts, original, long-standing, traditional, ancient, unadulterated, unadulterated from the beginning, that are not open to suspicion, will never be open to suspicion, and are unfaulted by knowledgeable contemplatives and Brahmins. Brahmin is sort of a word for a noble person in ancient India. Which five? There is the case where a noble disciple abandoning the taking of life abstains from taking of life. In doing so, they give freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings. In giving freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings, they gain a share in limitless freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, and freedom from oppression. And this is repeated for the other four abstentions. So it's in that's making the point that it's a gift to others, but also that we we gain a share in limitless freedom from danger. And they don't explain what they mean by that, but my guess is that it's basically that if we're not, if people know they can trust us, you know, that we're giving them this gift of non-fear, oh, this is a person who is careful with their behavior. They don't kill. They've even maybe said that, you know, they've made a stand on that. I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't commit sexual misconduct, I don't lie, and I don't use intoxicants, which can lead to carelessness. Um, then people, the idea, I, I think the idea is that then uh, we're less likely to experience those things from others because, um, yeah, people tend to respect, you know, ideally, people tend to respect people who are, uh, who have this kind of behavior. And we're just not getting ourselves in as much trouble, you know, if we're not stabbing people in the back, if we're not telling, gossiping about people behind their backs. Yeah, these ten things tend to come around. What goes around comes around. <laughs> so that's one reason is, is this motivation of compassion because we care about others. So we want to give them this, this gift of not having to fear us. And then the next motivation is, like I was saying, to learn about our minds. Um, yeah, and so these five uh, trainings can act like mindfulness spells. So, um, you know, if we see the intention to want to use our sexual energy in a way that we think might cause harm, and we've taken on this training, even though it's not clear, you know, it's not specific what sexual misconduct is, but although there, there are some specifics, I think it's about refraining from adultery, um, that may be the only specific I've seen there, but I think more generally it's refraining from using our sexual energy in ways that can cause harm. And we all know how easy it is to cause harm in that area because it's so sensitive and um, there's so much energy there and desire there. I think that's why it's highlighted as its own training area. So yeah, these five are really, I think, just so I appreciate how pragmatic it is. You know, it's not really, they're so earthy and it's not some transcendent, uh, yeah, thing. It's like, okay, humans, what do humans tend to do that gets, get them into trouble with themselves and with others? 
and, and pointing these out. So to have some kind of objective standard that we can hold our behavior up to can just help us be more aware because I think we can justify things, we can rationalize things. And that's where, you know, people can have, take issue with these because they're so clear cut and life is more messy. You know, what is, what does it mean to not take what's not been given? Um, you know, but it's, uh, it's not about, yeah, always having a perfect objective answer. It's really not about, yeah, an objective answer. This is where it's, you know, the definition of sila as ethics is, um, yeah, maybe bringing in too broad of a concept because it's, in the end, it, the deeper motivation is just to learn about our own hearts and minds. So it's more like the intention of acquisitiveness, the intention of greed or manipulation that we might see, even just to ask that question, like say we find a $20 bill on the ground. No one would fault us for picking that up, but we can look at our mind and uh, what do we do with that? Do we even try, you know, to, to, do we even think, oh, whose might this be? Again, I'm just using that as an example. I don't know. I mean, I would probably, I would probably, I don't know what I would do, but at least I would have that question, like taking, if I've committed, if I've, if I have this as a value to not take what isn't offered, then it just highlights all the ways that we might, you know, fudge that. Is that offered? You know, was, is that given to me? Or do I just want it? And then, so then I'm not looking so carefully at the behavior. And Ajahn Suchitta in the book makes this point. Um, so I'll just read what he says. Talking about these five precepts. He says, these may sound really basic and boring, hardly a sublime vision of the transcendent. They're not that decorative or grand, but the transcendent point is not what they look like, but what they call forth, what it takes to keep them, and the effects that they have on your life. Yeah, and, and I think that's really been true in, in my experience. You know, it calls forth creativity uh, and just kind of, there's something beautiful about when people kind of self from a self motivated place have that interest in the ethical nature you could say of their actions and are not just assuming yeah i'm basically a good person but are which is nice when we can have that sense you know yeah I'm basically i'm doing my best and i can feel good about that but uh, the Buddha encouraged his seven-year-old son, there's a discourse where he's talking to a seven-year-old son, that he should, his son should reflect before, during, and after taking an action. Was this action for my well-being and for the well-being of others? And long-term well-being, uh, I think, may be how it's phrased. So this kind of ongoing reflection. Um, and I think, like, from a place from a point of view of just wanting to, um, yeah, kind of have my, um, to not have to think about it, that can sound oppressive, like to have to always be questioning, like, I just don't want to have to think about that. But from the point of view of just um, the joy, the happiness of being able to review our actions and feel good about them, and the joy of being able to discern, you know, what might feel off and to be able to um, make adjustments. I think that's what we're tuning into as opposed to some, yeah, trying to be perfect. Because that, we can just use that to feel bad about ourselves. Um, and he makes this point, Ajahn Suchitto, later just about how in discerning skillful and unskillful in our actions, we can actually be more honest about the full breadth of intentions that arise in our mind. And because we're choosing more and more to align with as best we can um, the skillful, then we're, we feel a little, we can take it all a little less personally, including, oh, you know, he says, as one looks into the mind more fully and meets the floods, 
the floods are sort of the way the mind gets, gets flooded and kind of gets off balance. And there's four floods, the flood of sensuality, so attachment to sense experience, sense pleasure, um, um, becoming, so having the sense, oh, I'm going to become somebody, who am I going to become? And getting caught up in that in a way we get off balance. Um, attachment to views, so having some view, I am this kind of person, or uh, you know, the world should be run this way or whatever. Any view that we cling to can really kind of close us down and have us be less sensitive. And then the flood of ignorance, which is sort of what keeps us in the dark about how these floods operate. So he says, as one looks into the mind more fully and meets the floods, all kinds of inclinations that are unvirtuous and subpersonal come to light. Murderous instincts, jealousy, and spite some pretty dark stuff can be thrashing around in there. If one doesn't have confidence and faith in one's temple of awareness, one can get very confused and depressed about it all. This is where the idea of establishing good-heartedness and generosity as a foundation pays off so that, the, so that the mind's foundation can be built on intentions like these that one has carried into action. Then one can acknowledge the negative forces and energies that move into the mind and through not encouraging or building on them, one can withdraw emotional energy from those channels. Yeah, so in that way, um, we want to, with our mindfulness practice, we want to see everything that's there. But I think uh, one of the reasons that sila is empowering is that we realize that we we do have a choice and we can choose to strengthen um, wholesome qualities. And that's really, this whole list of these 10 paramis is really making that point. Um, you know, the 10 paramis can sound like just beautiful ideals, like uh, generosity and, and goodwill and patience and resolution and truthfulness, but they're very, yeah, they're very down to earth and they are something that through bringing them to mind, through contemplating them and just through, yeah, bringing them into the midst of our life, you know, truthfulness. What does that look like? Um, we can, we can learn about them and we can strengthen them. We can cultivate them. And then we can feel, yeah, a little bit more, um, grounded and protected and, uh, have some sense, yeah, of, you know, there may be, there are all kinds of intentions that arise in this mind, and that's why it matters which ones I align with, which ones I choose. So I want to talk a bit about what supports us in this sila and being careful with our behavior. And the main two factors are called hiri and otapa. And <laughs> they have somewhat unfortunate English translations, just because I think, like I was saying earlier, we kind of in the West maybe have this inheritance of self-judgment. Um, so the word, the English translations are, at least one translation is shame and compunction. So not, not great in terms of <laughs> associations. Like we tend to think of shame, you know, as this uh, unhealthy sort of shame where it's just, I'm a bad person. So shame may not be the best translation. And it's all, you know, with translations, it's really about finding one that that works for you. But I think to not throw shame away right away, we could consider what someone who is shameless, you know, shamelessness, where you don't, yeah, any action goes. So, you know, maybe a better translation would be conscience for shame, where there's this sense of internalized values that I hold myself to. And when I act out of accordance with them, what is that feeling? So, yeah, regret, maybe shame, and maybe there's a healthy kind of shame. That's for us to explore. 
And maybe that when it's unhealthy is when it's when we're completely identified with it. But I think the kind of shame that could be healthy is where it's actually coming from a sense of self-esteem and self-confidence. Like, this is the kind of person I want to be. These are the values I have. When I act out of accordance with them, it's not up to my standards and whatever we call that feeling. But the point is that it's a helpful feeling because it's what keeps us uh, following you know, our values. If we didn't have that, that pain, you know, we wouldn't have, it's sort of a barometer, it's, a, it's an inner compass. And one thing that I like to say about this is I think that, that <laughs> whatever that feeling is, that hiri, uh, that pain, I think it is, if we're mindful of it, it sort of already uh, has a feedback mechanism built in. And I think a lot of us have a tendency to add extra pain, <laughs> which is like the extra shame or self-judgment, like, how could you? You're so bad. <laughs> As opposed to like, just because there's already pain, like, oh, can't believe I said that. Or, and just like that feeling of remorse, you know, that's another word we could use, remorse or regret. Uh, so my, my sense is that that already has the wisdom in it. And um, yeah, we don't really need to, it's, it's really about identification. If we take that on as, yeah, some truth about who I am being a bad person, as opposed to just, there are skillful and unskillful intentions in my heart and mind, um, and being real about that. And feeling, yeah, feeling some, some regret when we act out unskillfully. But not in a way that just feeds in on itself, but a way that leads towards, you know, making amends if we need to, or just clarifying for ourselves. oh, this is an area where it's easy to cause harm, or this is a person where it's easy for me to, you know, act out, or whatever we might learn from that. So that's Hiri. And then Otapa compunction, uh, which is kind of a, maybe not the most common word, but it, I think the distinction is, it's more, another translation is fear of wrongdoing. So this is more external. Um, here is more internal, you know, our internalized values. And otapa is more, what would people think? What would people say? What would people I respect think? Or even, you know, what would the consequences be? So this is, you know, sense of compunction is, is what kind of keeps yeah, it's, it's a um, kind of keeps things orderly where, yeah, I could, I could rob a bank, but I would get in trouble. So it's more externally um, motivated. But I think, and I think that can, you know, both of these can, you know, can be unhealthy, you know, with compunction or with an external orientation. Um, I think having people that we respect and having, you know, bringing them, you know, it's like, what would the Buddha do? What would Jesus do or whatever? You know, that sense of belonging to a community or being accountable, you know, thinking of our teachers. And yeah, I think that can be a support. Yeah, what kind of person do I want to be internally because of my values? And what kind of person do I want to be seen as in my community and you know i think sometimes we can like i'm a pretty rebellious person or pretty independent i would say and so you know we can kind of want to just do our own thing oh nobody can tell me what to do but you know the buddha was really clear about the value of having wise friends and and spiritual friendship and i think this is one of the main reasons because when we have people that we respect that we're in relationship with you know there's this sense of we're supporting each other and, and following our values. The Buddha called these two Hiri and Otapa guardians of the world, which is a you know a nice positive um, association with these. So maybe I'll just make one last point and then open it up and hear what others might want to share, ask questions. 
And that's um, this point that what's the deepest motivation for this sila, for being careful with our behavior. And all the Buddhist teachings are aimed, even though they operate on different levels, but the ultimate aim is um, peace, is the heart being free. So that's, it's interesting to think of that in terms of sila, because this can sound like, oh, I need to be really tight and really careful. But, so this is maybe a question we can reflect on is what, how could, uh, how could this being careful with our behavior have the flavor of peace? Um, and maybe it isn't always peaceful, but I think at least to check out, you know, do we have this association with being free to do whatever I want? But how many times have we done what we want and that doesn't lead to peace? And maybe it leads to problems because we acted out in some unskillful way. So the, maybe the peace is again like this peace, this bliss of blamelessness, like where we can feel like we're really it's like showing up in a full way, like uh, that it matters. Uh, and the kind of like integrity and wholeheartedness with which we show up in every moment, in every interaction like that, there aren't moments that we discount um, and that there could be a sense of wholeness or something there. But I think this point also is helpful in, in this topic of the ultimate flavor of peace that should um, be the flavor of all the Buddhist teachings and practices. So that can help us, you know, again, like this question, is this action for my benefit and the benefit of others, long-term benefit? And we can use that in our, including in our reflections and practices around sila. So if we find that we're getting tight around sila, if we're getting self-judge, self-judgmental, beating ourselves up, then that's not in the direction of peace and um, yeah, maybe strengthening unskillful patterns as well. So it's really, yeah, I think it's hard, it can be hard to distinguish between if we have this tendency to judge ourselves and the kind of the harshness of that from the care, you could say, just the, um, the beauty of this carefulness, it's kind of like, because um, the monastics, their sila, they have long lists of rules and they're not all ethical actually. A lot of them are just how you walk about, like carefully, mindfully, you know, so it's like composure. So it's sort of like, yeah, this sense of, of dignity where we, our actions are aligned with our, our deepest values. And again, and that it, like there's no aside from you know not causing harm. There's no prescription even on what that looks like. So even as I say, like acting in a dignified manner. I mean, we may not always want to be, you know, whatever we might imagine, dignified and calm. You know, there may be times when it's really appropriate and really just the natural expression of who we are to be boisterous and loud and funny and whatever, you know, we might be our different personalities, but all of that, can it have the flavor of peace? Can it not leave, you know, a stain, uh, you know, even in, yeah, just thinking about, you know, being a social being and getting our social needs met, even our sexual needs met, like, is there a way to be, you know, a fully engaged human being where, but at the end of the day, we feel clean. We feel like uh, things, yeah, don't leave a mark, a stain. Like, and I think that's a really beautiful thing to aspire to. And I think we can err on both sides of like repression. You know, well, I'm just not going to do anything because it's so easy to cause harm. Or like, well, you know, being careful is for uptight people, and so I'm just going to live and let live, and anything goes. But how do we be free in the middle of our life, be free with our actions, uh, but free to follow what's in our, ours and others' long-term interests and creative with that, nimble with that, um, not having a predetermined 
view of what that might look like. <clears throat> and this is where I think a sense of agency comes from, which is the other, I think, one of the benefits of this, where, because we're the only ones who really know, other people can't even tell sometimes looking at our behavior it might look good on the outside, but we know that inside we're really tight or, or something. So just this confidence that we can, as best we can, it's not always clear, but we can discern between what's skillful and unskillful, and we can orient in the direction of the skillful, which really supports our mind being at peace, not creating problems for ourselves and others, engaged in our life. The Buddha has this famous uh, discourse where he says, abandon what is unskillful, monastics, but he could be talking to us. It is possible to abandon what is unskillful. If it were not possible to abandon what is unskillful, I would not say to you, abandon what is unskillful. But because it is possible to abandon what is unskillful, I say to you, abandon what is unskillful. If this abandoning of what is unskillful were conducive to harm and pain, I would not say to you, abandon what is unskillful. But because this abandoning of what is unskillful is conducive to benefit and pleasure, I say to you, abandon what is unskillful. And he says the same with what is skillful. Develop what is skillful. It's possible. If it were not possible, I would not say to you, develop what is skillful. If it were conducive to harm and pain, I would not say to you, develop what is skillful. But because this development of what is skillful is conducive to benefit and pleasure, I say to you, develop what is skillful. So there's a lot of personal agency, you know, in the teachings, which I think is not always highlighted because there's also the receptive teachings. And I think a lot of us maybe in the West can be so kind of uh, have a lot of that striving energy. So it's really important to emphasize the receptive. But this discernment that wisdom can have and the being honest about that and doing our best to follow it, it really builds that self-confidence that we have the capacity learning. You know, it's an ongoing process, but that we can learn and we can discern and that that is for our and others' well, well-being and benefit. And so it gives us, it's kind of underlies the whole path that there is this, that we're not just at the mercy of conditions that we can learn and... Um, yeah, orient and orient in, in a certain direction. So I'll leave my comments there and um, yeah, maybe just open it up and see what reflections people might have on, on this topic of being careful with our behavior. Um, yeah, what you've learned about it in your life, probably something. <laughs> uh, yeah, and maybe sharing about this kind of balance between being careful and being tight and um, yeah and, and the happiness that that comes from that and and the yeah the regret and how we use that regret um, to to reorient so yeah and I know it can be kind of feel like a personal tender topic which I think yeah it is in a way, but um, so, yeah, whatever you feel comfortable sharing or any questions for anything I've said. And I'll get my phone out so that um, Jessica, you 